Hello all, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whenever you're watching this podcast, and welcome to the Goddess Project podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Carla Ionescu, and this week we are looking at Hera. Now, you might think of Hera as the nagging wife, and so the title of this episode is the not-so-nagging wife um, of Zeus. So we're going to look at all the ways in which Hera is incredible and amazing. If you're new to the podcast, welcome. Thank you so much for subscribing to this channel. Um, thank you for coming along with me and my talks about all the things I love and all the things I want to talk about. If you have been listening to this podcast from the beginning, I just want to send like a special thank you to you because I don't think that anyone knows how much your comments, your feedback, your likes, your ratings uh, on Spotify or wherever means to me. Um, I am an academic who just does this for fun, but also like all academics, Sometimes there's a huge imposter syndrome that happens. Um, and not that I don't think I'm qualified to talk about these things. Of course, I am. So <laughs> there's no imposter syndrome there. Um, but just the the fact that you're enjoying it and the fact that uh, I'm talking about something that you think is interesting and fun as much as I do. And so I just want to say thank you for coming along with me, um, you know, and yeah, just a special thank you to all of you. <laughs> um, and for those of you that are new, I hope you stick around and I hope that you share. And um, I should say at the beginning of this particular podcast that I have a course on Hera on part of the Goddess Basics course. So um, I am the founder of the Artemis Research Center. My area of expertise is, of course, Artemis and other Greco-Roman goddesses. And the Artemis Research Center has a learning platform where you can take short online courses. And our first series of courses is called Goddess Basics. And the ones that are up right now are Artemis and Hera. And then I have eight more that I'm going to put up over the coming months, couple of months. Um, so if you're interested, if you're someone that's really interested in goddesses and you've looked around online and sometimes it's tough to find online all the information or primary source information or like, what is the truth? Sometimes I come across stuff about Artemis or Diana where I'm like, oh my goodness, that no, that no, no. <laughs> um, and uh, I take that a little personally. Um, even about Hera, to be honest, um, I do both primary research for this podcast and internet research. Um, and what I find a lot on the internet is just like a one dimensional aspect of a goddess. And so I've created these short goddess basic courses, which are online courses um, for anyone that wants sort of the basics, right, on a goddess. Oh, hey, I like Hera, I like Artemis, I like Inanna, I like whoever, I have eight more to go. Uh, Persephone is coming up next. Um, and I just want to know something without having to get a degree or anything. I just want to know, like, what are the basic truths about this goddess? What's true, what's not true? And so I thought I'd make those courses because um, it's my own personal pet peeve, to be honest. And um and also, I think when people maybe want to use a goddess or work with a goddess or are inspired by a goddess, it's important to know her history. So all of that to say that the course on Hera is up, so it'll be more extensive than our podcast today. Our podcast today is maybe a taste of uh, the complexities of Hera, and uh, and I hope that you enjoy it. So that being said, for those of you that are watching me on um YouTube. I'm just going to pull up my screen. For those of you that are listening to me, as you know, I will describe to you what we're looking at, um, if there's anything in particular. Okay. So like I said, the title of this episode is Hera, the not-so-nagging wife, um, and we are in season two. Hoo -hoo. You know, when I began this podcast, I wasn't really... Um, thinking that I would do this many two seasons um, and I've got you know a list for season three as well so I'm very very excited to share this stuff with you guys so let's begin with the with the with the concept that everyone is familiar with Hera and that is the nagging wife of Zeus um, and I have this image of 
a pottery depiction of Hera and Zeus together. Now, there are a couple of histories that are important. For, for, to begin, Hera was originally a goddess on her, in her own right. And what I mean by that is she was not married off. And though there are some debatable primary sources, and by that I mean they debate each other and people use them for different angles or interpretations that they want to have, the most agreed upon by most experts is that Hera and Zeus were originally thrown together in marriage and uh, matrimony um, as a conquest of archaic pre-Greek goddess lore. And the way that we know that is that we have numerous of Hera's temples, which were led by priestesses only and were very pro-feminist. And I mean, I use the word feminist, of course, in ancient Greek, they didn't have this word, but they were centrally feminine and they were based on the divine feminine. And when the Greeks, and again, I use this word loosely because there's so much complexities to what we call the Greeks in the ancient world and then what we call the Greeks today. Um, and I talk about this every now and then just as a reminder to myself and to you guys too, that there's really no such thing as the Greeks, um, that they were mostly cities and villages ran by individual kings or rulers, and they were sort of united in different times of war in different ways. But I'm going to call them the Greeks for the purpose of our podcast because we're not doing a PhD exam, of which I had to do three, um, but we are, we're just having some fun. So the Greeks, I would say, the way that I define them here would be the patriarchal post-Mycenaean um, arrivals in the area of the Mediterranean, for example, places like Crete and other places in southern Greece. And when they arrived, one of the things that they brought with them, depending on which scholar you use, is um, masculine divinities. Not that there were not masculine divinities already, but masculine, powerful divinities. And of course, Zeus is one of them. Apollo is another one. Ares is one. Um, all of the males in the Olympian, uh, in the Olympian pantheon are later additions. So there are lots of scholarly debate arguments that actually the women or the divine feminine in the pantheon, like Athena, Hera, Demeter, Artemis, Hecate, all these other Greek goddesses, Greco-Roman goddesses, they were already independently successful before the Greeks arrived. So when the Greeks arrived, particularly around Hera, Hera is one of the few parthenogenetic goddesses. And we'll talk about what parthenogenesis means and what it means for Hera um, in a minute. But when they arrived, the power of Hera to both procreate independently and to hold the secrets, Hera is a Chthonic goddess as well, hold the secrets of the afterlife, of the underworld. Um, she was a goddess of uh, the cycles of life, like menstruation, um, a goddess, not of fertility in the sense that we think about Demeter, for example, like agricultural fertility, but the sort of private domain of women, pregnancy, bleeding, menstruation, menopause, what we call menopause now, the, the last sort of phase of life, um, organically or biologically speaking for women's procreation, all of those aspects were her domain. And she was often referred to as the queen of the goddess. She was also often referred to as a cow-eyed goddess. So she was sometimes represented um, as a horned goddess or a, a cows are often a symbol of nutrition and birthing and motherhood. And so she was associated with uh, cows and again, motherhood and, and uh, nutrition and all that kind of stuff. And so it's not an accident that she was... And she has a lot of children, uh, post-Zeus, uh, but pre-Zeus, there's some argument that she gave birth to Hebe or Hebe on her own, um, even before Zeus arrived. So it was it was poignant for patriarchal tribes that arrived in this area to contain, to um, contract 
and to, hmm, what's the word I'm looking for? I don't want to say in prison because that sounds a bit harsh, but to contain, to contain her power. Um, and to do that, of course, is they gave her, they associated her with their primary divinity, which is a thunder god. Um, and that was Zeus. And there is some discussion that the initial romance between the two was intense. There are some stories that say that uh, Hera and Zeus uh, spent 300 years in bed, you know, uh, an intimate <laughs> um, embrace. And so, uh, you know, and that's a good time. And let me tell you, even for gods, 300 years, in fact, um, is unheard of even for God relationships. And I should say that as far as a marriage, Zeus and Hera are the only ones out of the entire pantheon that have a successful marriage. I say that in quotation marks because it's not successful as we know, uh, but successful in the sense that she never leaves him and she never kills him, <laughs> uh, though she might want to repeatedly. And so in that way, they remain married and they are often the representation of a married couple or an example of a married couple. Now, this is really fascinating for us as scholars because what are the Greeks trying to tell us with this particular married couple, especially with how much Zeus cheats on Hera and how much Zeus, uh, Hera continuously tries to foil his plans, um, kills a bunch of other women um, or punishes them. Uh, because they're sleeping with her husband. I mean, this is a really Maury slash Jerry Springer story, right? Uh, I mean, and I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember Jerry Springer or Maury, but um, it's really that toxic relationship, but a relationship where the two people don't seem to leave each other. And um, really to me, as a historian, but also as someone who loves history, and I mean, those two are not exclusive, but what I mean is, even unofficially, what that really says to me is that human relationships in marriage, in contractual marriage, marriage is a contract, whether it's done in love or whether it's done for business is still a contract. So human beings are not meant to be in monotheism. Uh, monotheistic, haha, <laughs> monogamous relationships for eternity. Yeah. And some of you might not feel comfortable with that, but uh, I have been in a monogamous marriage for 26 years. And in the, without meaning to overshare too much, that relationship is amicably coming to an end because we have both come to a conclusion that um, we've put in our time. <laughs> A lifetime uh, warranty is 25 years. A, a lifetime penalty is 25 years. We've put in our time and it is time that we do some other things that we want to do. Um, and I'm beginning to see how healthy that is because as I look around as at other older, I have a lot of older family and friends, not, well, yeah, family and friends or friends of family that have been married for 50 years. My parents will be married for 50 years this year. Um, I realized that while that relationship is fascinating, it's not, uh, oh, I don't want my mother to yell at me. It's not necessarily healthy or it doesn't encourage independence and it doesn't encourage creativity later on in age and all these kinds of things. And so I say all of this because Hera and Zeus, I think, really exemplify this in the Greek world, in the Greek context, in the ancient Greek context, because the seducing women is not unusual for Greek men at this time, Greek married men. And because Greek marriages, literally, it depends on which period we're talking about, but let's go back to the Mycenaeans and work our way forward to the classical period and so on. Those marriages were citizenship marriages um, at some point. And so people got married out of a contract and you had to marry a citizen with a citizen so you can have a citizen child. And all the side relationships were acceptable to some degree. 
Um, there are some scholars that say that, in fact, women, because of the death and childbirth, did not want their husbands uh, to be intimate with them after they produced one or two children, enough citizens, you know, for their duty, but in fact, did send them off to um, brothels so that they could have pleasure with men or other women or whatever, um, and that that way they wouldn't become pregnant. There are also some studies that show that actually women, Greek women, so like matron, someone like Hera in the house, it was acceptable for them to have sex with other women, particularly servants or slaves. And there are some argumentable sources that say that women could have sex with male slaves, especially as we move forward into the Roman era, um, without consequence, you know. Um, but again, these are rarities in the sense that I most women and men married, so under contract, would have would have seen Hera and Zeus as the norm more than any other. Um, Hera being irked because Zeus is seducing all these women, but particularly Hera being irked because Zeus is having all these children. Because again, children is, uh, as as we know, is about inheritance, um, is about, is a threat to, of course, her own children and all of that. And so Hera then moves from powerful, independent queen of goddesses and of gods into nagging wife. And then she, people, people who tell stories like Homer, Hesiod, et cetera, all these dudes enjoy this version of her or perhaps see it very familiar in their own lives among their friends with their own partners, et cetera, that they really emphasize this aspect of Hera's personality. They, they give her the power that she's due because she is the queen, if Zeus is the king of the Olympians, certainly Hera is the queen, but um, but they minimize her power by appear, making her appear as though only concerned with who Zeus is having sex with. Now, Hera, of course, is a product of Rhea and Cronus, the Titans, who are a product, of course, of Gaia and Uranus. And Hera and Zeus are brother and sister. Um, and so this would not have been unusual. Of course, gods marry their brothers and sisters all the time. But you can imagine a really weird and a little bit uncomfortable relationship of brother-sister and then having to be married um, and share power, right? So there is an acceptance of that because of their sort of royalty. And there's this old concept. And as you know, in Egyptian dynasties and in other dynasties of brothers and sisters being married to sort of keep the blood pure, which is silly because we know that that eventually does the opposite of keeping the blood pure. Um, but there is also this, um, this tension between Hera and Zeus. There is a constantly like a one up and that's a very sibling rivalry in many ways, less so than a husband and wife partnership. And so when Zeus does something bad, as we'll see, Hera does something bad too. And then uh, if Zeus is doing something, Hera tries to do the opposite. So there's more of sibling rivalry to this than there is of a husband and wife partnership. And very rarely do Hera and Zeus come together on something. Um, I mean, the Olympians come together every now and then, but very, very rarely. Um, very rarely does Hera go to war um, I think that she does her own assaults on like Heracles, for example, and others, especially women, but all of these assaults are underhanded in some way. They're from behind a curtain. Um, very rarely does she ever join in battle. Very rarely does she begin, a, you know, one-on-one -on -one fight. She actually sends people to do her bidding. She sends Artemis to kill a bunch of people. She sends Athena to do things for her. She sends um, lots of people to do her dirty work, or sometimes she sends beasts and things like that. So there is a very queenly aspect to Hera. There's a very um, sharing of um, or sharing out the responsibility um, or sharing out the tasks, right? Um, she's really good at multitasking and she's really good at sort of... Um, giving everybody something to do. And so 
I want you to try and put aside your concept or your idea of the nagging wife for a minute while we proceed. I want you to imagine that the nagging wife aspect of her character is a fiction, is a rumor, is a is something that began as um, a prop- purposely propaganda to lower her importance, to make her seem secondary, and in fact, to make her seem like Zeus is all she really cares about. Um, and I want us to move forward in some of her, in some of her powers. Now, I've mentioned that I'm going to talk about parthenogeneticism, what parthenos means. And and if you're not watching me on YouTube, I have four different uh, reptile slash insects that are famous uh, on fish yeah, that are famous for parthenogenesis. So the Komodo dragon is one of my favorites. The boneheaded shark is another one that uh, performs parthenogenesis. Um, the gra- the waram- 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 waramamba virgo grasshopper is another one and the gecko, some geckos. Um, and so what is parthenogeneticis? And Hera is the most popular goddess. And I'm and someone may debate that with me and say that perhaps um Artemis and um Demeter are also parthenogenetic uh, goddesses. They are, but that's a different story, maybe for another day. But Hera is the most prolific, that's a good word, the most prolific um, parthenogenetic goddess. And by that, I mean that she has six children pretty much on her own. So Parthenos really refers to virginity, but, but it's not the Christian virginity. And I know we get caught up on this and we talk about this all the time. Virgin in Greek, in the term of Parthenos, really means... um, not being with a man, but not like you have a hymen per se, but that you are, you are not engaged in sexual contact with a man. Um, And this term really is actually an empowering term for female goddesses, because for example, Artemis is seen as Parthenos, um, Athena is seen as Parthenos, and we call them virgins. But when we say virgin in English and in today's Christian sort of muddled world, we think hymen intact. Um, And whether or not, I mean, you know, these are goddesses. It's very difficult when we do biology of goddesses. But for them, virginity means they abstain from sexual contact with men. That does not necessarily mean that they do not have sexual contact with women. And in fact, women are famously... Um, known for intimacy with each other when there's no men around, although there's no actual writing down of these intimate relationships. And so for a long time, for me, for example, with Artemis, I've always suspected that she is actually intimate with her nymphs and her and Iphigenia and Callisto and all these other figures. But there is no evidence because in, the Greeks did not see that as sex per se. So they wouldn't... they. It wasn't something that was part of popular writing. Could have been part of popular culture, but not popular writing. And so love affairs between women was very much a um, something that was, I don't know how to explain it. There was something that was accepted and not always talked about. So, sorry, I got lost down that track. Oh yes, Parthenos and Virgin. Well, after Christianity came, um, with uh, the Virgin Mary, virginity became very much entrenched in um, in hymen culture. <laughs> hymen culture. And so I would argue that the Virgin Mary is a remnant or a descendant of someone like Hera, of someone like Isis, of someone like other famous, powerful parthenogenetic goddesses. Um, but the issue with the Virgin, so it's like it's like an arc, an echoing back. But what they did with the Virgin Mary is they created this so-called immaculate conception or virgin birth. Well, immaculate conception, let's call it that first, because the virgin birth is about the birthing process. But um, based, uh, they they added sort of the male God, so the so the so God or Yahweh or Lord, whatever 
Christians call him, depending on your denomination, um, somehow impregnated Mary through thought or something, right? Because clearly it's not intimacy. Um, grace, I don't know. There was something that happened to Mary that the male God did, or what we call the male God in Christianity did, uh, to get her pregnant. And it's never really explained what that is. And a lot of that has to do with parthenogenesis, the ability of a female to create asexually. Okay. So parthenogenesis refers to virgin and Genesis. So a virgin birth. And oh, actually that does tie me back to the Virgin Mary and the virgin birth. And, but most importantly, it's not the birth itself or the hymen it's the fact of reproducing asexually. So if I was to define parthenogenetics for you, I would say goddesses who reproduce asexually. It doesn't matter whether they're virgins or not. Certainly Hera reproduces asexually even after she spent 300 years in bed with Zeus. So she's not a virgin, but she is able to have a virgin, I call in quotation, a virgin birth because Zeus is not uh, participating. Yeah. Now, Many, many, uh, you know, almost all animal species reproduce sexually, but about 1% of animal species do reproduce by parthenogenesis. The Komodo dragon is famous. Um, and the Komodo dragon, for example, is famous because when there is a male partner around, they reproduce sexually. Um, while when there is no male partner around, the female dragon is able to reproduce asexually. And so... One method of parthenogenesis involves sex cell division and recombination, while another just produces an egg with a full complement of, of DNA, okay? Parthenogenesis also happens in uh, fish, amphibians, and other reptiles. So it does happen in nature. So sometimes people will go, oh, um, this is unnatural. But actually, it does happen in nature, and it most certainly happens to Hera. And not only does it happen to her, she purposely... Um, becomes pregnant without the help of a male god, okay? Now imagine the power in that. So imagine that you are a patriarchal society or group that is coming down into the Mediterranean and finds that there is at least one, if not several other goddesses and priestesses that work for this goddess or worship this goddess in the temple who know the secret of, repro of asexual reproduction. Now, there are lots of theories <laughs> that in the beginning, the very first human, and I don't know, and I don't know, don't quote me, I'm not an expert in this, but I don't know if it's homo sapien sapien or other sapiens or other bi uh, bipedal um, apes like us. Um, if 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 that if we go that far back, but there is this kind of theory that floats around every now and then. I'm part of a couple of groups and I see it a lot where they say that there there was a time, 10,000, 5,000, 80,000, 50,000, whatever years ago, when human women could reproduce asexually, whether it was with a god or a spirit or whatever, and that the secret was passed down from woman to woman to woman. Now, Scientifically speaking, a woman is born with all the eggs that she will have at the time of conception. And so there's this theory of an unbroken chain that, for example, when I was conceived, I had all the eggs that I was going to have in my body. Therefore, my daughter, the egg which produced my daughter, was already in me while I was being conceived by my mother. And by that argument, if we narrow it down tinier and tinier, if my daughter's egg was in there, then all of her eggs were in her eggs or were in her egg. And therefore there's this unbroken chain of women. And that's scientifically correct. So women carry eggs that are all female. So you know how people in ancient history used to kill women because they couldn't have boys? Well, only men carry the XY gene. So only men can have boys. Um, women only have... Um, female eggs. And I'm sorry, this is turning into a bit of a science uh, lecture, but I just want to explain the fact that you could have a line. If if women, human women could reproduce asexually, then they would reproduce only females. 
And then those females would reproduce only females and so on and so forth. So should this be possible or even just a, a ritualistic practice of women passing down knowledge to women and having women and all this kind of stuff without the uh, help of, of any male figure, certainly any human male figure. Imagine the power of that. Imagine the power of procreation that that would give. And so many scholars who study Hera will argue that one of the reasons why she's so quickly married off is because she is able to, to perform this parthenogenetic procreation and she's able to perform it well, both to create other gods and as we'll see, to create monsters. But also I want you to think about how powerful is Hera? You know, how, how secondary does she become to Zeus? And how powerful is she or was she before she was married off? You know, and one could argue, one could take that much further and say, how powerful are women single? <laughs> and how powerful are they with a partner? And there's pros and cons for everyone, for men and women in that question. But it's fascinating to me because, you know, Hera has been around for 5,000 years, give or take. And the marriage of Zeus and Hera have been around for two, 3,000 years, 3,000, 2,000 years. So, I mean, this is a long story of the human condition um, and the plight of women, you know. And, you know, there's that old saying, what is a queen without a king? Uh, historically more powerful. <laughs> and I think that Hera absolutely is an example of that quote. Um, she was much more powerful without Zeus uh, and much more dominant in her field. So let's talk about the children that she has. I'm going to talk about four um, because there's a few others um, that or sort of grandchildren or side children, or uh, they're, they're contested children. But I'm going to talk about these four uh, because these four are less contested. My favorite one are Hephaestus and Typhon. Uh, these are the two favorites that I would like to talk about. But let's get Aries over with. Um, there is a tradition and there are some primary sources that say that Aries, that Hera has Aries um, out of spite because Zeus has some child, I can't remember which child, if it's Perseus, I think it's Perseus, um, or some child. And so Hera has Ares on her own. So she, she procreates a male um, on her own. Now, there are other traditions, later traditions, that say that Hera and Zeus have Aries together and that Hera, uh, that Aries is a, is a child of them two together. So I want to start with Aries because he's a little bit, um, he's a little bit on the, he's on that, he's on that middle ground of um, um, possibly parthenogenesis, but also lots of sources say that he is the child of Aries, um, Zeus and Hera. So Aries could be one. Hephaestus, however, is for sure only Hera. And Hephaestus is basically, be again, Hera has Hephaestus out of spite for Athena. Now, these stories are a bit more complicated than they seem because people traditionally, and sometimes my students will say this, oh, well, Zeus has Athena by himself. No, he does not, right? Zeus impregnates Metis and in fear of Hera, right? Hera knows that he's, or is looking for him and blah, blah, blah. He's going to find out. She's going to find out that he impregnated Matisse. He swallows the pregnant Matisse. And then we kind of lose the story. We assume that Matisse gives birth to Athena in Zeus's body and Athena grows, you know, so this is like, you know, you got to suspend your belief. Of course, this is mythology. Um, they're not talking biology here, but mythology is important for metaphor and symbolism. So, Athena is fully grown inside of Zeus after she's birthed by her mother Matisse and she's banging on the on the the on on her shield and it is uh, Zeus who asks Hephaestus for help to crack his head open and let her out but many sources will say that actually Hera has Hephaestus knowing that 
Zeus has impregnated Matisse and will have Athena. Again, you have to suspend a little bit of belief, but it's very Maury, very Jerry Springer, right? But my favorite part um, about this Hephaestus, not only do I absolutely adore this male god, he's one of the only male gods um, that I like. And the, he's the only, in fact. Uh, I sometimes like Hades too a little bit. Um, and I don't mind him, but I can't stand the others. I mean, Ares is sort of non-existent most of the time. Um, and But Zeus, Apollo... Oh, Dionysus, actually. I apologize. Dionysus, I also like a lot. Yes. So Hephaestus and Dionysus, which, uh, by the way, they uh, are sometimes uh, shown together in different uh, stories. Uh, but those two I can handle. But Hephaestus, I really, really like. And my favorite, there's a couple of things that I really like about Hephaestus. And maybe I will do a, um, a whole podcast on him um, because I think he's very important. And I, again, overlooked a couple of my favorite things. Number one, once again, Hera is able to birth a male offspring. So remember we talked about how in biology, if in theory, human women could um, procreate asexually, they could only birth females, biologically speaking. And again, it's a theory, not a fact. Um, Hera does the incredible thing and she has a male heir or a male a son out of spite she is able to create her to to control her procreation in such an advanced way that she can have a male child out of spite now because that tradition is so old it could not be totally erased by the greeks and it could not be given to zeus because the tradition of old says that this child was born in spite of zeus so what they did is they created these stories. Some stories say that Zeus was so upset by this betrayal, right? She didn't even have sex with a dude. But anyways, it's a betrayal because it is a betrayal for women to control their own procreation. Yeah. I mean, in the USA, they still have abortion bills. I mean, it's 2023. And there is still this control of women's bodies, um, which is both in, infuriating and, and pathetic, you know, and, and, and very ignorant. But procreation is a powerful thing. And there is no accident to the, to the fact that um, so many male scientists and other scientists um, are looking to clone people and are looking for the artificial womb and are looking for all this kind of stuff. Because if you have control of procreation, you have control of humanity. And the only gender species, I don't know, bio biology that has, not species, <laughs> biology that has control over procreation has been women for eternity from the beginning of time. And so it is, it is part of that um, part of that that creates the stories of Zeus hating Hephaestus at first, and so there's these story. There's these two stories. The one says that Zeus actually throws Hephaestus um, from Mount Olympus when he sees him, throws him down the mountain, and because of that, he breaks his legs in a permanent way. The other is even more disturbing that Hera herself is frightened or disgusted by the abomination of her birth and throws him herself down um, off the mountain and he breaks his leg and becomes crippled. And then there are stories that Hephaestus is fine. You know, some, some primary sources don't mention anything about his legs being crippled. Uh, but but there are stories in which he hates his mother so much, he feels unnatural. He feels like something is very off. And so because of that, um, he binds her and he builds, you know, he's a he's a builder. He's a he's a I was gonna say tool and die maker. <laughs> he's a blacksmith. He makes weapons, right? And he makes things. Um, and he's an engineer in some ways. And he makes this chair and he 
he pins her in the chair and she can't get out and and he keeps her there until she tells him the truth of his birth and the unnature of it and why did she have him and so there's this creation of antagonism between mother and son um but in reality i would say there is no antagonism between mother and son and in fact when zeus goes to hephaestus to crack his head open for athena there doesn't seem to be any antagonism either and so many Scholars also will say that perhaps this kind of parthenogenetic birth of Hephaestus is an echo back to the true power of Hera, which is to reproduce parthenogenetically. Um, and so that's the story of Hephaestus. And maybe I will do a podcast where we'll go into detail about his life and oh, his love life. Oh, poor guy. And all the other things that go on with him. Um, the other two children that I have here are Hebe or Hebe. Uh, also, Aletheia uh, sometimes is said to be born parthenogenetically from uh, Hera. He Hebe or Hebe is also the name of a famous uh, oracle priestess at the temple of Hera. And sometimes people, in some primary sources, she is the embodiment of Hera. And so uh, it's not a it's not a coincidence that she is seen as being born of Hera parthenogenetically without the help of Zeus. Again, later, later Greek sources always stick Zeus in there, but primarily and archaically, Zeus, uh, Hera can have children, okay, tends to birth children um, without the help of Zeus or without the help of any male consort. And then we have Typhon, who is one of my favorite of the monsters that Hera births. Um, she, he is a fantastic figure because he is what they call a monster. He has snake legs and wings and a human body. And again, there is this idea that he is monstrous in appearance because Hera conceived him unnaturally, again, in quotation marks. Um, and he is quite a powerful monster. And then he is the um, the father of other snake monsters. Um and other, you know, powerful figures. And he is the child of, um, of Hera. I would, I would say, well, maybe not the most powerful, but he is, he is her best creation. And I mean that in the sense that he is such a, uh, he is such a, he's so powerful biologically, he is symbolically, he's got the wings of gods, the snakes, uh, the snake legs, which again, Hera is often associated with snakes. Um, snakes are some of her, one of her symbols. And it wouldn't be a surprise that um, Typhon is born with snake legs. Um, there are some stories that Hera uh, sort of colludes with a snake in order to give birth uh, to Typhon. But um, again, those are explanations. So those are later explanations for the powerhouse that Hera really, really is. Um, and she and she is a powerhouse. So imagine creating, procreating, not just female um, children, offspring, but male and powerful males. If you were to take just these three, Hephaestus, Ares, and Typhon, as three men, gods, that Hera has created without the help of any male gods, that alone would be a powerhouse. That alone is a threat. Put Ares and Hephaestus and Typhon together as a family, you know? And that's like, uh, it reminds me very much of like, a, a that would be a great supernatural kind of, um, themed story, right? You've got these three brothers um, and they're fighting evil or perhaps mm -hmm. they're fighting Zeus and his nonsense, who knows? But, um, you know, that that that's a powerhouse trio. And uh, and add to that Hebe and Eletheia, uh, you know, Hebe is often a, a goddess of youth and life and immortality and Eletheia is a goddess of childbirth. I mean, you've got the entire world or the entire existence or experience of existence of humans and gods in the children of Hera. And so this is what I mean about Hera being underrated. She is often, um, people don't talk about the fact that she's given birth to so much offspring that she created on her own. 
And so I think we've come to a point where we can all understand and see marriage as conquering. So one of the things that um, happens a lot in once Zeus is married off to Hera is that she is very, very often, more often than not, depicted with him. And so here, for example, I have a statue. And if you Google Zeus and Hera, you can see it of um, her kind of sitting beside him a bit in front of him. And he has one hand on her shoulder and he's pointing. He's always pointing at something. There's a lot of statues in which Zeus is pointing and she's sitting beside. So he's kind of showing her something. Um, and she's turned a little bit towards him, listening to him. So there's a very... Uh, it depends. There's, it, it, there's. You could look see it as a controlling. You can see it as sort of mansplaining. That's how I see it. You know, when a dude is like touching you and he's like trying to explain something to you and you're looking at him and there's a lot of mansplaining. Um, but there is a definite visual representation in which Zeus is sitting with Hera, and he's always pointing her or showing her something. So there's always this kind of concept that he's like a teacher. Um, yeah, or showing her or explaining something. And so the way that the cult of Hera, the pre-Greek cult of Hera was conquered was through marriage. And many can argue that the way that women are conquered today and in the past is through marriage. Because once you are married to a man in particular in a heterosexual marriage, you slowly become, you know, it's so funny, you know, the irony. In some ways, you become the, I'm trying to think of a word. It's not submissive, but, you know, you kind of take a step back and let men do men things. At the same time, you become a very mothering figure, you know, like where's your socks and paying the bills and making sure the kids have underwear. I don't know. Right. Um, and so this is very much the way that Hera is perceived and that Hera is presented actually as a figure that is not as strong as Zeus, even though I would argue she's even stronger and certainly was before marriage, but then also a figure that delegates to him you know the the big decisions are now made by the king and she becomes secondary like i said queens and kings whenever a queen has a king the king tends to be the one that does all the things unless you have a queen that has a consort prince then that's different um and so i don't know if uh, you probably know what i'm saying already but i think when you when you have a marriage between a man and a woman versus a woman that is single so when a woman is single, she's got to do everything by herself, which puts you, I don't know how to explain it visually, but it puts you like you're in front, you're you're up front, right? You're up front, you're doing everything by yourself. And in the Harris case, she's even birthing by herself, rituals by herself, running temples by herself, everything has priestesses, all that kind of stuff. When you're married, you kind of take a step back to now be in a partnership. You divide yourself in a way you you don't have to be upfront 100%. You now give yourself room to maybe relax and I'm being optimistic. And now you're sharing the load, like they say, and you're sharing the bills and you're sharing blah, blah. And even in the most uh, perfect, perfectly divided, perfectly equal marriage, the one that was upfront now becomes a part of two. And lots of people say, well, you know, we're not halves, we're two independent people, but it's not true. When you live with someone and you share a home and you share a life, and especially when you have children and you share, 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 you literally share. So you could be two independent people, but you're still sharing a life versus if you're a single person. And so I, I'm, and I'm not, I'm not anti-marriage in any way. I think there's, our marriage is a great contract, especially around children, if you have children, um, and especially if it's a good marriage. Um, and so I was blessed with a good marriage to raise my children in. Um, but there is still a loss for women. You know, there was this study many, many years ago that did who are the happiest people in the world. And it was single men, single women, married men, married women. Yeah. 
And so they did happiest to least happiest. So four, right? Single men, single women, married men, married women. Okay. So number one would be um, the least happiest. <laughs> and four would be the most happiest. So who do you think was at number one? I'm going to give you a minute to say it out loud while you're watching me or in the car. Who was so out of the married men, married women, single men, single women, who is the least happiest? Yeah. Number one, the least happiest. So the least happiest is married women. Yeah. The second least happiest. So now we have single men, single women, married men. Who is the second least happiest under married women. Some of you might be like married men, married. No, the, the least, the second least happiest was single men. Okay. Single men are number two. Number three, you can imagine is single women. And number four, what's left over? Married men. So the most happiest with their quality of life, is married men. Ironically, the least happiest with their quality of life is married women. And in between there are single men and single women. And, you know, psychologically, you can look up the study. I don't remember when it was done. A few years ago now, it was big study, big, big study. Um, but I mean, you know, I mean, you just have to really think about it to see why that is. Because married men get all the benefits of family, um, having someone take care of them. They say also say that married men live longer than single men because their wives nag them. I say that word on purpose to get healthier, to eat healthy, take their medicine, go to the doctor, blah, blah. Single uh, married women are the least happiest, of course, for the same exact reason that they take on the entire world. Let's be honest. They take on the entire world and carry it. And so What's really ironic about that study is that this is equal, exactly represented by the marriage of Hera and Zeus. He is absolutely 100% happier and more powerful after being married to Hera. He would have been nothing without her. He would have just been a thunder god. Oh, well, who cares? But because he's married to Hera, he becomes king and she is queen. And they become sort of a powerhouse unit. But in doing that, she ends up losing her independent power. While she maintains the skill to create parthenogenetically, she loses the power because her worshipers and followers and others move towards Zeus because of her in a way, you know, because she's married to him. And so there's that automatic association. But, and so she loses, there's a loss there for her. And while they're powerful together, um, there's definitely a winner and loser in that marriage. And she is conquered. She is then controlled um, by Hera. I mean, by Zeus, sorry. So it, lastly, a little bit before we look at Hera in popular culture, so I'd like to look at her in popular culture. Um, one of the things that I wanted to talk about, and if you take the course with me through Goddess Basics, we will go into more detail about this and other. We'll certainly go into more detail about her children. We certainly go more in detail about um, the cult practices and festival practices of Hera and all those other things. But one of the things that we also go into detail about is her relationship with Heracles. And so here I've called Hera the anti-hero because she often hates the heroes. And that's because those heroes are usually products of an affair, of Zeus having an affair. But she particularly hates Heracles. And it is unclear whether he hates her or not. Some sources say that he names himself Heracles to spite her. Um, to be like, ha, look, I am I'm taking on your name. Um, there are some sources that say that he takes on the name Heracles to try and win her favor. There's all kinds of stuff. But he does kill um, several of her animals or animals that are re related to her. So there are there is at least a couple of scholars that talk about how the labors of Heracles are actually representations of patriarchal conquest of um, of goddess culture, and that Heracles represents hero culture. 
and hero culture is very masculine. And so hero worship sort of takes over the goddess worship. And so this is why I call Hera, Hera the anti-hero. In fact, the word hero comes from Hera. Um, and this idea that her trying to fight off Heracles and her refusing to make him into a hero and and sort of always trying to um, take him out and punish him is actually the struggle of pre-Greek goddess culture trying to, it's sort of metaphorical for the struggle of pre-Greek goddess culture trying to maintain or trying to not be conquered by this hyper-masculinity that um, Heracles represents. And the image that I find the most disturbing is this that I have on here. And you can Google um, Heracles, you know, and Hera, and it would come up. And that is the, for a hero, so, okay, so for a hero to be considered a hero, he has to nurse at the breast of a goddess. He has to be fed by a goddess, especially an immortal hero like Heracles. And of course, Hera doesn't like him. So there's no way that she's going to let him feed at her breast. So the story that's really fascinating excuse me, is, um, is the one where, with Heracles, where um, he sneaks up or Hermes, so Hera's sleeping and Hermes takes him up, I guess to Mount Olympus where she's sleeping and he puts her at her breast to um to suckle there so that he can get the magic milk remember this is the connection of Hera to the cow um to the nourishment there's an old tradition of prince and princesses princesses and emperors and pharaohs that can only be legitimized through the feeding from a goddess nurtured by a goddess or at the breast of a goddess Isis is famous for doing that Hathor is famous for doing that Hera is also famous for doing that and, but she doesn't like Heracles. And so um, Hermes kind of sneaks him in and puts him at her breast. And there's, a, the, the story is that she wakes up, of course, jolted. Imagine there's a baby suckling at your breast and kind of pushes him off her and her milk spills. And from this milk that's spilled, uh, the Milky Way is created. But it is enough time at the breast for um Heracles to be seen as a hero. And then um, after that, and perhaps rightfully so, Hera continues <laughs> to plague him his whole life and to punish him his whole life, all the way to the very end, of course, where um, his wife, whose name's not coming to me, I want to say Daenerys, but it's something with a D, Deanna, Deanna's, um, uh, Diana, I don't know, anyways, um, betrays him with the with the coat uh in the blood um of the oh my god why is the story of Heracles not coming to me um of the guy that he kills on the boat whose name I can't remember either but anyways um and he puts on the coat and he melts in fire and then he is supposedly saved by Zeus at the very last minute and thrown into the constellation or he is brought back by Zeus and he's up on Mount Olympus etc so Hera throughout Heracles' life continues to plague him and continues to try and thwart him and continues to fight him. She really, it's almost as though she really sees the, the corruption of this hypermasculinity and what that will do to, let's say, her people and to her cult and to her story. And, uh, you know, that's quite prophetic because that's exactly what happens um, Heracles, of course, becomes highly worshipped. And one could argue that the image of this hyper-masculine brute force dude um, is pretty much the same today when we think about, you know, jocks or big men or military men or all this kind of stuff. Um, that image of masculinity has become such a norm, even though I, ironically, it is not the norm. Most men are not Heracles, but uh, it has become such a norm for us in society and has created so much damage and so much violence and so many, you know. And so in many ways, Hera's attempt, failed attempt <laughs> to thwart Heracles, to thwart his heroic 
feats to thwart everything, you know, to sort of, well, I mean, she starts with him in his, in his bed and in, in his crib as an infant trying to kill him with her snakes. Um, it's almost like she, yeah, she, she is trying her very best to overcome the conqueror, to conquer the conqueror. And, and she's not successful. Um, and as a result, I guess we can see today in our culture, you know, so much of what that type of hypermasculinity has produced. And so that leads me then into Hera and popular culture. And so I thought I would give you these three examples um, because in some ways they're kind of funny, but in some ways they're also really telling of our culture and the way we continue to tell the story of Hera. So the very first one that I have here is, I didn't know this. I actually looked it up when I was looking up Zeus and Hera popular culture is this uh, Mercedes, <laughs> this Mercedes commercial in which Salma Hayek is Hay uh, Hera and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger is driving. He's, I guess, Zeus. And, and certainly they're, they're very traditional garb. Um, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger has white hair and a white beard and the whole thing. And he's wearing, I think, some kind of, battle gear in this really fancy modern Mercedes while Hera has her long hair and her Greek white, um, I guess, dress. Um, and uh, they're both driving together and they are seen as sort of a happy, wealthy couple, right? Like royalty in this, in this commercial uh, for this car. And Again, she's the passenger. And I, I I really love this image and this commercial. Well, I don't love the commercial. Actually, I don't like the commercial, but I I I think it's very useful because I think this is exactly what I was trying to say earlier with marriage. She becomes a passenger. And people can say, well, you know, you're married and you can drive, but huh? <laughs> How many women do I know when they get in their car with their boyfriends or partners, they always let him drive, even if it's her car. Even if it's her car, she will let him drive. Um, and many women become passengers. And especially when you have children, uh, you become the passenger because then you have to reach back and take care of the children. And I'm not saying this is 100% all the time. I'm not saying this is like an oppressive rule that happens in marriage or relationships uh, and heterosexual relationships. But what I'm saying is that there is a, a sort of a conditioning that happens to men and women because men will take the wheel <laughs> for the same reason. They might not even feel like driving sometimes, but they will take the wheel because there is something in our culture and our conditioning that even without anyone really telling us, well, for example, in this commercial is the exact kind of conditioning and propaganda that brainwashes people uh, without, with brainwashes all of us without us knowing. She is in the passenger and he is a driver. And I think that this really encompasses marriage. Um, no matter how equal you are, when you drive a car, there can only be one driver and one passenger, well, one side passenger. Um and more often than not, women take the passenger side, even if they are a better driver. <laughs> um, and so I really like this image because I think it embodies everything I'm saying uh, about Hera and about what happened to her, right? Where I would argue, using this metaphor of the car, that Hera had been driving her vehicle alone or with other women in the car for centuries before Zeus showed up and suddenly she becomes a passenger. Um, the other is um, um, one of my actually least favorite Disney movies of all time, okay, um, is Hercules. <laughs> um, it is, I, I don't even know what to say. So you, I'm in the way of this image, but you probably know it. Um, Zeus is depicted, again, as this hyper-masculine figure very much a Hercules of his own, on his own, uh, white bearded, white haired, but the body of a, I don't know, 20 year old bodybuilder. Okay. Um, Hera is for some reason depicted in pink and purple, uh, pink hair, purple skin, blah, blah. So if you haven't seen the Disney version of Hercules, I don't know if you want to waste your time with it, but, um, and both of them, both of them, 
And particularly Hera in this image that I have here is holding baby Heracles. And both of them are looking at him lovingly. And of course, he's looking up to his father, not his mother, right? Because it's his father that's the important figure in his life, not his mother. In this case, Hera is his mother, which is absolutely ridiculous because it goes against everything ever written in all of Greek history. Um, but, you know, Disney, <laughs> they like to just tell the story as they see it. You know, who cares if it's historically inaccurate uh, or absolutely ridiculous? Um, so and then there's a little Pegasus that's like looking at uh, Heracles, although, again, Heracles never rides Pegasus. It is Perseus that rides Pegasus after he kills Medusa. And Pegasus is born out of Medusa's body, uh, Medusa's Pegasus mother. So Disney has really effed up this whole story. But I think the most violating for me is the fact that you now have Hera and Zeus as a happy couple holding baby Heracles like he's the most precious thing. And throughout the whole movie, they're like these supportive parents. Um, and it's just ridiculous. And again, what it does is it places Hera in the passenger seat. It places Hera in the mothering role, in the nurturing role, which is fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with the mothering, nurturing role. Hera certainly is a nurturer and a mother figure. But it just, it 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 makes her embrace the very thing that was her destruction. So it's, it's a real perversion. I mean, I don't know that if Disney thought about it quite that deep. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, propaganda sometimes and conditioning is thought out quite deep. But even if they didn't, what this really does, and young young children watch this, what this really does is show the traditional family, big, scary man, boom, boom, uh, thin, you know, wispy woman, um, care, mother carrying this uh, boy son that is also going to be big and strong like his father, um, both of them looking at him adoringly. And, you know, it just, it, it totally, it, it, yeah, it just sets, it just, it, re it reconditions. It makes it seem like this has always been. And my favorite thing about history is learning that actually the way we live now is not the way that we have always lived and it's neither natural um, nor normal, right? So yeah, I can go on that. Uh, I can go on about that forever, my friends. But if you watched Hercules when you were a kid or if you on Disney or any of that thing and you thought this was kind of cute, um, I, you know, I watched it when I was younger as well, but now when I think of it, it just makes me cringe. It's so cringe. The whole thing is cringe. Um, and it's very much this hyper masculinity and this sort of measuring yourself by your physical strength and, uh, from zero to hero. I mean, it's such a joke because clearly he's not a zero because he's the son of two gods. And so how are you as anyways? I can go on about that. I do have a whole lecture on Heracles, actually, that I do sometimes when people invite me to talk about uh, hypermasculinity and goddess culture. And I do this whole thing on Heracles. Um, maybe I'll take some of that and share it with you guys in the future podcast, because I also think that Heracles is often misunderstood and his story has been one of the most popular story in human history to be readapted, changed, and reconditioned or used for conditioning um of you know generations so maybe i should do that so uh if you do like that leave something in the comments uh saying yeah totally let's do heracles um more sympathetically <laughs> than i've been doing him right now um but uh and i am sympathetic to him sometimes but in this case um he really is the um the representation of the conqueror and of this hypermasculinity. And last but not least um, is uh, one of my second least favorite depictions, which is um, from the anime Netflix series, The Blood of Zeus, uh, the image of Zeus and Hera. And again, we have a similar depiction um, where Zeus is, again, big bulky dude, um, bearded, long hair, blah, blah, blah. And Hera is again, tall, thin, 
in this case, quite sexy, blah, blah, blah. But my, you know, the image that I have here is again, him standing beside her, holding her shoulder, kind of holding her in. Um, and they're both kind of facing forward. And again, in this show, they are very typical, very typical toxic marriage, um, very typically represented in the, like I said, the sort of propaganda of marriage. But for sure, even in this show, Zeus sort of outranks her, outpowers her, defeats her, you know, her strategies and her planning. Um, so they have a very sort of toxic relationship that is on and on, not on and off, but like happy and unhappy um, for and against kind of with each other. And again, you know, a, a major show that has an opportunity to really represent Greek gods and goddesses more in their primary source ways um, and, you know, falls back on the adaptations of modern culture or falls back on the adaptations of Western Christian um, frameworks of gender and of storytelling. Um, and so I was really, I was actually, I was quite disappointed with that show. Um, I watched it because I really love anything to do with Greek, Greek Olympians. And I guess a little part of me is always hoping that someone is going to tell the story as it was. And, you know, one of my dream jobs is to work on any kind of TV show or movie or whatever as a historian you know, history expert or a Greco-Roman expert and, or even, I mean, I would love to have somebody who's writing a story about uh, any Greco-Roman divinity, like get some actual historical help in telling the story because the, the original stories are so fantastic and complex and there's so much room to create these beautiful like exciting stories and yet I feel like people just continually fall back in the same cliche stories you know so actually that's my dream job is to is to be you know some kind of contact expert or historical expert on uh, on a show that's trying to represent you know um certainly ancient Greek history in it, and certainly ancient Greek God or Olympian gods in their sort of original form or earliest form. So, um, so that's a goal. We'll see what happens. Um, and so then that is, that brings me to the end on Hera, my friends. And I hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. I hope that you've seen how one of my favorite things, and this is why I've created the Goddess Basic Courses, one of my favorite things to do is to share with you the primary source, the earliest text, the interpretations of the earliest material, and then sort of trace that to see how do we get from the earliest places to the way that we see this divinity or this tradition today. That's one of my favorite things. And it's my favorite thing about history. It feels a bit like detective work. And so I've built these courses really out of that passion because, I, you know, I, I mean, they're not overwhelming, so they're not like a full university course, but I think that you get enough uh, primary source reading. And then of course I have recorded lectures, uh, a few recorded lectures where I'm taking you through these steps and through the readings. And then there's a few reflections that I ask you to do and a few pieces of writing that, you know, you can submit if you want. And then I I give you feedback and we talk about it. So there's lots of room in there for anyone that sort of likes a goddess or feel at this point we're doing goddesses, but eventually I would also like to do symbols and I would like to do other sort of higher concepts, what I would call intermediary courses. Um, but to just have trust that this course, the material that's in this course is scholarly and primary enough that I can understand the source of this divinity and then, you know, take it from there, wherever I want to go with it and do whatever I want. Um, and I think that was also the goal of this podcast. It's just that this podcast, podcast, of course, is more informal and there's no reading required. Um, and, uh, and we just kind of talk 
about whatever comes up. Yeah. But um, but I think the goal for me is the same because I think for a long time I have felt that the stories, the, the the stories are not being told correctly. Even with all the primary source we have, even online, the stories are not told correctly. The stories are being retold in the same cliche, biased fashion. And it drives me a little bit crazy to keep going to movies, to keep getting my hopes up, to watch TV shows, to do all these things, and to end up just seeing the same shit, you know, the same cliche story about Hera, the same cliche story about Artemis, same cliche story about all the goddesses, the same cliche story about witches, same cliche story about Heracles. Like it drives me nuts um, because there's so much material out there. And also to look for or to to try and dig up information on any of these uh, divinities and to find so much that is really, you know, it's quite fan fiction, you know, it, people just take pieces of things and, and, and make them into something. And then they write a whole website and they're like, yeah, this is the way it was. And so anyways, I guess one of my things is to try and provide as much clarity as possible. And that's really what, that's really what the goddess project is about. And that's why it's called the project because it's an ongoing project. Um, and so I hope that you're with me because you also enjoy that. And because you enjoy talking about sort of early, early sources and uh, because you enjoy tracing um, these divinities along with me into from the ancient world into the modern world. Um, so thank you so much. Um, if you want to follow me around on my travels, I'll be traveling this summer. I'll be doing lots of fun stuff. Follow me at Artemis Expert pretty much everywhere across social media. Um, subscribe, share, rate. Um, Break everything that you can, hopefully because you like it. And uh, I will see you next time uh, for the next Goddess Project topic. Have the best day. Talk soon.